recorded. So you should see a message come up and you'll have to select OK. And it will be posted on the NTMWD YouTube page. Out of respect for our presenter, please keep your microphones muted and your video off to conserve bandwidth. Our speaker is looking forward to answering your questions, so please type those in the chat. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Becky Bowling. Dr. Bowling is an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist for Urban Water with Texas A&M AgriLife. She is the AgriLife Extension Lead for the Urban Water Innovation and Sustainability Hub at the Dallas Center. She works jointly with Ag AgriLife Research and with AgriLife Extension's extensive network of specialists, regional program leaders, and county extension agents to develop and deliver outreach programming and resources to critical audiences on the topics of environmental stewardship, water conservation, and water quality protection for urban landscapes and beyond. We are very fortunate to have Becky with us today. Let's get started. Becky, please share your screen and I'll monitor the chat for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Helen. So we are gonna try something a little different today. Um, and we're gonna use a platform called AHA Slides and it allows you to interact with the slideshow from your phone. And so if you wanna join, you can either put in the link that's there at the top or you can scan this QR code. There'll be some fun little quizzes and opportunities for you to answer questions along the way. And um, so feel free to join and participate that way. Um, I think it'll be kind of fun and different uh, to do that than to just sit here and let, listen to me yammer on. So <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead now. I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to scan this and, and get in if you're interested. Um, and then we are going to, it just says none of you are. You guys should definitely try it. I think it'll be fun. Okay. So. Today we're talking about uh, some of our North Texas turf grasses. So I'm going to do an introduction of some of the species that we see a lot here in North Texas. I'll talk about some other species as well briefly that uh, you may hear about from time to time. We'll talk about the importance of uh, choosing the right turf grass. And we're going to talk about um, to some of the trends that we're seeing in turf grass breeding across the country. I bet you didn't know that there was a turf, uh, such a thing as turf grass breeding. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit and how this all ties back to having a more drought resistant, uh, more water efficient landscape. So I'm um, very excited to kind of move forward with this topic uh, today. So first question I have for you guys is what kind of grass do you have? What kind of grass do you have? So this is just a poll. So you can select, uh, I think up to three different grasses. If you have, you know, my yard, I've got Bermuda and St. Augustine. So um, let me know. I'm just curious what you've got in your yard. And if you don't know, that's fine too. You can just hit the no clue. <laughs> All right, so we've got one Bermuda. Okay. Uh, so you also have in the chat, Dennis has zoysia. Zoysia, perfect. All right. Okay, so it is really important, uh, you know, that we choose the right turf grass. It's just like any other plant in our landscape, right plant, right place is something we hear a lot and same principle applies here, right turf grass, right place. Every turf grass is gonna offer its own unique attributes, characteristics. And I'm just gonna tell you that there's no such thing as a one size fits all turf grass for the state of Texas. This is usually where somebody makes a joke about artificial turf. We have a lot of issues with artificial turf as well. Again, it's all about pros and cons, thinking about what's the right fit for your particular uh, landscape or even some a particular part of your landscape. We may find that one turf grass does really well in our front yard and a different one would do better in our backyard based on things like shading uh, or water, uh, soil moisture, things like that. So we want to take into consideration kind of several things when we're thinking about this. We do want to think about what kind of light we have in our landscape. Uh, all of our turf grasses are gonna want at least some kind of light. We don't have turf grasses that are gonna grow well uh, in absolute darkness. And in situations where we do have a lot of really extensive shade, that's where we may wanna consider an alternative. And I'll talk about that more here in a little bit. 
We also wanna think about the watering requirement of some of these grasses. We will see a lot of variability in terms of how much water these grasses require, how much they're able to tolerate a some degree of drought. And depending on how much we are able or willing to irrigate, we wanna take that into consideration as well. We may wanna take into consideration what we call traffic tolerance. In other words, if I've got two really big dogs and three kids that are constantly running around in my backyard, I'm going to want a turf grass that's able to tolerate that wear and tear versus I may be somebody that really spends very little time walking around my yard. I may just be kind of passing through it as I am on my way to my vegetable garden and that's it, in which case I may be able to get away with a grass that's not as traffic tolerant. I uh, also want to think about things like disease potential, insect susceptibility, um, how often do I have to be out there mowing it? How short can I mow it? So these are all different factors that can play into choosing the turf grass that's right for us. Now, we often divide turf grasses into two major categories. We have warm season grasses and cool season grasses. You'll see from this image here, they have completely different growth habits. Uh, cool season grasses have what we call a bimodal growth habit. That means that they have two primary peaks of growth, and those are gonna be during cooler times of year, spring and fall. Warm season grasses, which is what we're gonna be more familiar with here in Texas, are typically going to green up early in the spring and they're going to uh, stay, continue to uh, grow more and more as we get into summer. Now here in Texas, one thing we see is that we may actually get a decline in that growth as we get into this time of the year. It just gets so absolutely hot and repressive for these grasses that they're just happy to get by sometimes, especially if we're not irrigating them a whole lot. And then we may see that growth increase again as we get into uh, September, October, we get a little bit more natural rainfall again at the end of the growing season. Now, if we compare these two categories of grasses side by side, um, we're going to see that they are physiologically different from one another. So this is not just kind of an arbitrary title where we say, oh, this is warm and this is cool. They actually have different physiologies. Warm season grasses, which we also call C4 plants, they're more water use efficient. They're more nitrogen use efficient. In the grand history of the planet, warm season grasses are gonna be newer plants and they evolved in areas that were much warmer and drier than some of our cool season grasses. Uh, we'll find that a lot of the cool season grasses we're familiar with originated more in Europe in more Northern climates. Warm season grasses that we're familiar with are gonna originate closer to the equator typically or in Africa. So we'll see that they also have an ideal temperature range um, of new growth between 80 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If we look at the cool season side, by comparison, we see that the ideal temperature range for growth is between about 60 and 75. So we know that that's about what three weeks a year here in Texas that we're going to have consistent 60 to 75 degree temperatures. So very often warm season grasses tend to be the best fit for us here in Texas. I'll talk about a couple of exceptions, um, especially if we are up here in North Texas or up in the panhandle, uh, but generally we're going to be looking more to those warm season grasses. They also tend to be more drought hardy. Uh, and they have better stress recovery. And what we mean by this, this is a nice way to describe some of those more invasive characteristics that some of us may not love about warm season grasses. We think about uh, Bermuda grass stolons getting into our raised beds or into our ornamental beds, and that can be very frustrating. Uh, but the upside of that is that when a Bermuda grass is injured, it can heal itself and recover itself using those stolons. Uh, cool season grasses, conversely, a lot of times they tend to be just little bunch type grasses. So if they get injured or worn out, we've got to reseed them uh, to really get those to fill back in. So we're going to do a little uh, quiz here. Which of the following do you think, based on what I just described, is a cool season grass? And it's okay if you don't know the answer. We've got four options on the board. We've got Bermuda grass, Kentucky bluegrass, Buffalo grass and St. Augustine grass. So we're thinking about which of these is going to be more uh, prone to growing in cooler temperatures, cooler climates. All right, Dennis put his vote in the chat. We also had one vote there. Kentucky bluegrass, there's another vote. So you guys are correct. Kentucky bluegrass is going to be our cool season grass of these that are listed. 
Here's an overview. So we have over 700 species of grasses here in the state of Texas. A lot of these are used for forages or biofuels. Um, and we've got about 14 or 15 that are going to be used more often as turf grasses. And up here in North Texas, we're going to be particularly familiar with four or five of these. We may see several of these others are going to be more popular in other parts of the state, just based on our huge climate variability that we have across the state of Texas. Um, so here on the left hand side, Side, we've got several of our warm season grasses. Um, so I'll let you guys put in the chat, let me know what you think are the two most grown warm season grasses here in the state of Texas. You guys let me know in the chat what you guys think. Two most grown warm season grasses. And I'm just going to run through these really quickly. So Bahia grass, we're going to see more often in Far East Texas, or we're going to see it used by the Department of Transportation as a roadside stabilizer. A lot of times uh, we might think of Bahia as more weedy. Um, and so, you know, we don't love to plant it in our yard, but uh, we do see more turf type Bahia's than there used to be. And if you go to Florida, if you're from Florida, you will find that Bahia grass is often used as a cheap builder option in the yard there. All right, many of you have responded in the chat. St. Augustine and Bermuda is correct. St. Augustine and Bermuda are definitely our two most planted turf grasses here in the state of Texas. Uh, you guys wanna put in the chat, let me know what you think number three is. I'm just curious. Um, so we'll talk more about Bermuda here in a minute. We'll also talk a little bit about buffalo grass. Nice thing to note about buffalo grass is that it is a true native. And so we can get some really nice benefits from incorporating it into the landscape. It's not the right fit for every situation, but it is going to be very drought resistant and very cold tolerant compared to some of these others. Centipede grass we'll see in typically climates with acidic soils or rainfall of 50 or more inches a year. Um, so that doesn't really sound like Dallas, but it sounds like maybe if I go east to the piney woods. And so that's where I may see some centipede grass growing out there. Uh, seashore past pollen is becoming maybe a little bit more popular. Uh, you guys are correct. Zoysia is number three. Zoysia is number three. So let me ask you guys another question, just based on its name, seashore past pollen. What do you think seashore past pollen's superpower is? What do you think it's tolerant of that some of these other grasses may not be? You guys put it in the chat. Yep, Becky was quick to answer salt is right. So seashore pass pollen is an extremely salt tolerant option. Um, we see it very commonly uh, along the coastal bend areas of Texas. We've got a couple farms that grow it down in South Texas um, and some interest in trying to move it further north, but it's not always very cold tolerant. So that's the challenge there. Then of course we have our St. Augustine and our Soisha. And I'll talk about each of those in a little bit more detail soon as well. On the right hand side, we'll see a lot of our cool season options. We may see some of these more often used to overseed, you know, so if you play baseball, you got kids or grandkids that play baseball. Um, we will often see more baseball played on perennial ryegrass than Bermuda grass, just based on the timing of, of the year. Um, we'll also see soccer fields often overseeded with uh, some of these grasses as well. We do see that up here in uh, North Texas, North Central Texas, that tall fescue uh, can be a pretty good option in the shade sometimes. I've seen this, we've got some new varieties of tall fescue that are available uh, that are a little bit more heat and drought tolerant and we can plant them in the shade. So those of you that have been to North Park Mall, I went there recently for the first time in a couple of years. It still looks really good. I was worried after everything that's happened the past few years, but it looked really good. And they've got a, um, a yard out there near the tip. It's near Tiffany's, I think, or near, uh, yeah, I think that's right. And they've got a mixture of St. Augustine and tall fescue. And it doesn't look terrible. It's doing pretty well there in the shade. So we are seeing that that can be an option, but it's not going to do very well out in exposed sunlight here in Texas. So let's talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. We'll start with Bermuda grass. Um, so Bermuda grass is definitely our most common pick for most of our recreational sports sites here in the state of Texas. Uh, we will sometimes see some examples um, 
of the, uh, or some exceptions to this, um, but it is very traffic tolerant. It's pretty uh, heat and drought tolerant. Uh, we can mow it at a, a relatively low mowing height. So it becomes a pretty good option uh, for those more recreational spaces that we're gonna deal with. This is a picture of course of Kyle Field. If you're an Aggie, this is hallowed ground. Uh, I work for a &M, but I went to Texas Tech. So I always have <laughs> mixed feelings, uh, but it is a beautiful field. Uh, the Kyle Field has a special hybrid Bermuda grass grown on it called Latitude 36 Bermuda. It's a new variety from Oklahoma State. And if we look over here, we've got a little table to kind of overview some of the characteristics of Bermuda grass. So let's just touch on some of this pretty quickly. Uh, Bermuda grass is a full sun grass. It loves to be out with lots of good sunlight, at least six to eight hours of light a day. Uh, if we try to put it in shade, it's going to have a harder time. It'll typically get kind of leggy. It'll start to thin out. We do have some varieties like celebration that will tolerate just a little bit of partial shade. You know, if it's under a tree that has a pretty open canopy, it may do okay. Uh, but for the most part, we think of this as a full sun grass. Uh, this is why it's become this and the fact that it's cheap. It's a very popular builder option for new homes. But what we might see is as your property gets older over time, trees get bigger, the Bermuda grass may not, to do, may not do as well anymore. And we may have to look for some alternatives. Uh, Bermuda grass is, like I said, tolerant of moderate to high traffic. It also is relatively drought tolerant. Um, so we will see that it does not require a significant amount of watering. Um, there's a colleague of mine that works in San Antonio that she deals with a lot of cu uh, customers that are concerned about killing their Bermuda grass. And she always says, go ahead and try, see if you can. <laughs> uh, even when we wanna get rid of it and replace it with something else, it can be hard to get rid of. Uh, it can require pretty frequent mowing, um, just depending on what our mowing goals are. It also has a little bit higher nitrogen requirement to maintain that nice green dense look compared to some of our other grasses. It has low to moderate disease potential. If we do the right practices, we have good balanced irrigation. Um, we typically don't see too many disease issues with this, particularly in the lawn. Uh, it can have some insect susceptibility issues though. We will see that things like grubs are very fond of some of our Bermuda grasses. So that's something to keep an eye out for. It's very rapid to establish and very rapid to recover. So we may see that while it takes uh, eight to 12 months sometimes for a zoysia grass lawn to get established, it may only take Bermuda grass about three months under optimal conditions to get to the same level of establishment. So very quick there. Uh, we also see Bermuda has both seed and sod available. So if that's, you know, if my interest is I wanna have something that I can seed out, Bermuda may be a great option for me. We don't have that option for every grass. Uh, it's going to have low to moderate cold tolerance. Some Bermuda varieties will be more tolerant of cold than others. All right, then we've got St. Augustine grass. Uh, St. Augustine is going to have a very different look and feel to it. Those of you that are familiar with our North Texas grasses know this. It's going to have a much coarser texture to it, thicker leaf blade, taller, chunkier grass. It can have a look to it that a lot of people love. It can have a look to it that a lot of people hate. People are very divided on this and Bermuda grass, I find. Um, it is going to be one of our more shade tolerant warm season grasses. It can tolerate um, moderate shade. It still likes to have about five to six hours of light a day. Um, and so this is just something to keep in mind. Again, it's not gonna grow in a closet. So if you're starting to see that your St. Augustine is thinning out significantly under the tree, it may be a sign that it's just too much shade there for that St. Augustine grass. Uh, it tolerates low to moderate traffic. It's not gonna tolerate a tremendous amount of traffic, but it'll be okay for a backyard with a little bit of playing and some dog action. Um, it is typically thought of as a moderate water user compared to Bermuda grass. And I put some asterisks, asterisks there uh, because we do have here at Texas A&M a, a breeding program for turf grass. And one of our main grasses that we breed is St. Augustine. And we have a new grass, a new St. Augustine coming out of our program. It will be more available next year and in 2024. It's called Cobalt St. Augustine. So I'll put that in the chat. 
and it uses about 60 to 80% less water than any other St. Augustine currently on the market. It's very drought resistant, very resilient St. Augustine grass. So it's, I really think it's just going to completely change the way we think of St. Augustine and will probably be the first of many um, to start to have this trend. So we're very excited about that. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that is, what, what kind of features that grass has that, that make it more drought resistant, but um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, St. Augustine is going to typically require pretty frequent mowing. Uh, it's got a moderate to high nitrogen requirement, not quite as bad as Bermuda grass, but it just depends too on what your aesthetic goals are. You know, I hardly ever fertilize my yard at all. It's maybe not the greenest and the luscious in the land, but it's very sustainable <laughs> and it looks, it looks good enough. That's kind of how I feel. Um, St. Augustine can have moderate to high disease potential. So a colleague of mine, uh, she and I call this the diva of turf grass. Uh, it's going to throw a fit if you baby it and do too much to it. It's going to throw a fit if you don't do enough. And so we will see here um, that depending on our watering practices, depending on our fertilization practices, we can have a lot of issues with diseases like take all root rot with diseases like large patch, or you may know it as brown patch. So these are things to kind of keep in mind. It all just comes down to a balanced management program. And it's not just about uh, doing too little, but it's also making sure you're not doing too much. Very easy to overlove this grass. Uh, this is gonna have low to moderate insect susceptibility. There's gonna be some insects that don't particularly care for St. Augustine grass if you put it side by side with Bermuda, but there's others like chinch bugs that are going to much prefer St. Augustine grass. Now we don't get too many chinch bug issues up here. Uh, if I was down at Houston, I might be more concerned about it, but for the most part, not too many issues with bugs up here in our St. Augustine. It's got a moderate to high rate of establishment. Um, this is one that is a sod only option right now. We do have some efforts to try to create some seed for St. Augustine, but right now you can only purchase it as sod or as plugs. You're not gonna be able to find seed uh, for this particular species. And then again, we're going to see that this is, has low to moderate cold tolerance. Some varieties will be more cold tolerant than others. So I'll give you guys a great example. Uh, Raleigh St. Augustine tends to be a little bit more cold tolerant. And so we tend to see that that's like the number one St. Augustine that's grown up here in Dallas right now is Raleigh. Whereas if I go down to Houston, I'm going to see more of a different St. Augustine called Palmetto uh, that tends to be more shade tolerant but it's not quite as cold tolerant. So it's a little bit more challenging for us to maintain it up here. All right, then we've got zoysia. Zoysia grass is kind of our, uh, <laughs> zoysia grass is kind of our Goldilocks grass. So it's, you know, it's, there's a, I always tell people there's almost a zoysia for every situation. We see tremendous variability in our different zoysia species. Um, and so there's, there's zoysias that are going to be more drought tolerant than others, zoysias that'll be more cold tolerant than others, zoysias that'll be more shade tolerant than others. Uh, but there is a lot of diversity there. And so if you've heard about zoysia and you're trying, you you want to choose zoysia for a particular purpose, just make sure you do your research because uh, depending on what you pick, it may or may not check that box for you. Um, so zoysias can, like I said, some can be pretty shade tolerant, particularly our finer textured zoysias, the one with the narrower leaf blade. Uh, these can tolerate a pretty decent amount of shade. They're going to be more comparable to St. Augustine grass. Our thicker uh, leaf blade zoysias, those are not necessarily going to be a shade tolerant. They're going to prefer more full sun uh, environments, but they'll offer other benefits for us. Um, they tend to be those coarser textured zoysias tend to be more cold tolerant, more drought tolerant, and they tend to be more tolerant of how we typically manage a home lawn. Uh, we find sometimes with the fine textured zoysias, they've got some, some needs that are a little different that a homeowner can't always keep up with, and so they may not do well in the long term in a home lawn setting. Zoysias have a variable traffic tolerance. Um, they can tolerate a decent amount of traffic, but the tricky thing about zoysia is that once they become injured or worn down, they can be slower to recover and repair themselves than something like Bermuda grass. They're just a little bit slower growing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. That's why we don't see them a lot yet used in high traffic situations very often. 
Uh, they're going to have variable watering requirements just depending on which variety I choose. So it, like I said, some can be pretty drought resistant. Others may require a little bit more uh, babying in the water arena. Uh, these tend to require in general less frequent mowing. They're not going to grow vertically at the same rate as a St. Augustine or a Bermuda grass a lot of times. And so that can be kind of a plus to having a zoysia grass. Uh, we also see that they have a lower nitrogen requirement. So this is another plus. We're not having to fertilize them as often, and, and this can be a nice environmental benefit. Um, zoysias tend to have lower insect susceptibility. Uh, their, the leaf blade content is not very palatable to some of the insects that frequent our landscape. So for example, a fall armyworm. We get nice little waves of those every couple of years, and they like to come in and eat down all of the leaves in our lawns. Well, they don't really like zoysia grass very much, and neither do a lot of their cousins like sod webworm or cutworm. Um, so we can see that that can be an advantage to having a zoysia grass. But on the flip side, they can be a little bit more susceptible to certain diseases. Uh, making sure we don't over fertilize, making sure that we cultivate regularly and deed thatch them can help a lot with this. So what I see a lot of times with zoysias is that if somebody does not de thatch them at least every one to three years, they start to get too dense and thick and they start to choke themselves out and we get a lot of disease that likes to move in there. We have mostly sod and plugs available with zoysia and just two seeded options right now. We may have more in years to come, but seeded options are very limited and we only right now have coarse textured seeded zoysia. So if you like the fine texture, the, the narrower leaf blade, you're gonna have to purchase sod or plugs. Uh, we also will see, again, moderate cold tolerance with zoysia grasses, again, depends a little bit on the variety. We have several zoysia grasses that are, have been developed specifically for the transition zone, so for cooler environments. We have some zoysias that are going to do a lot better up in Amarillo than they would ever do in Dallas because they are more tolerant of those colder temperatures. So it just depends on, on what variety we're talking about and what we're looking for. All right, last big one we're going to talk about for North Texas is going to be buffalo grass. So again, this is our big native turf grass option. Um, and I love buffalo grass. I think it's a really good fit for certain situations, not every situation. Um, but I live over in Plano, uh, not too far from the Chisholm Trail, and there's a lot of buffalo grass that's growing along that walkway, and it looks really good. And so sometimes it can do great. Um, buffalo grass is going to have the biggest challenges when we, again, overlove it. It's not going to want too much water. If we look at this map down here of the state of Texas, you can see if I go too far east, I'm going to get too much rainfall and too much humidity. And that's when buffalo grass has a harder time being competitive. It's going to technically have some disease issues that show up. It'll have some Bermuda grass competition. So it likes things a little bit drier. It's a great fit anywhere where I'm willing to have something kind of similar to a little prairie. I'm willing to keep the grass height a little bit taller. I'm willing for there to be a little diversity there. I want that more natural native Texas look. I'm not trying to walk too heavily across that area. I just want something that is a little bit of a shorter version of a prairie. That's where buffalo grass is gonna be a really, really good fit. Less frequent mowing requirements. Some people choose not to mow buffalo grass at all, depending on what they're comfortable with in terms of height. A very low nitrogen requirement. In fact, we can do more harm by uh, fertilizing this than good a lot of times. It is gonna be a little bit slower to recover. Uh, if we don't overwater, we don't over fertilize, we don't have a lot of pest issues. So again, it's just about kind of letting it do its natural thing a lot of times. Um, we can purchase both seed and sod for buffalo grass and it is going to have moderate cold tolerance this is kind of an advantage uh, of it being a native is that it's a native across prairies that go further north and so we will see that it can have some pretty good cold tolerance compared to some of these uh, introduced species that are from much warmer climates So if you're curious about other grass or what grasses are grown here in the state of Texas, this is a good place to start. This is our Turf Grass Producers of Texas website. So it's our kind of our producers, all of our producers across the state. They have a, a network and a website that they co-fund and it's just texasgrass.com. And the nice thing about this website is they actually have a homeowner search option where you can go through and search, you know, what species you're interested in. And then under each species, it'll list the different varieties that are grown here in Texas. Texas, it'll produce a map 
so that you can know where some of those farms are and how close they are to you. If you've got a truck and a trailer, you can go pick up a pallet of sod yourself. You don't have to go through a landscaper to do it. A lot of these farms will sell to you directly and it can be a lot cheaper that way, uh, but it's a lot more work too. So, uh, but it, it will at least give you a sense of the different things that are grown here in the state. Um, is turf grass always the right choice? The answer is no. We definitely have situations where turf grass is not appropriate, either because it's just a really excessively trafficked or excessively moist spot. Um, so there are some areas, for example, around pools, or um, I worked with a, a, a high school a few years ago that they have a, a football field that was being used for every single sport. I mean, there were people on that field almost 10 hours a day doing band and then playing football. And it was so heavily trafficked, they could not maintain grass on it and it became unsafe. Uh, to be on it. And so, you know, they chose to do a synthetic turf. Synthetic turf is not the, the go-to for, for every situation. It's extremely hot. Um, there can be some unique management challenges there. Uh, personally, don't think it's very well suited to our North Texas climate. We get too much rainfall. And so as much as possible, we want to try to maintain living vegetation that can capture all that good rainfall and help keep our environment cooler. Um, and so, you know, if you can't maintain turf, you know, you've got too much shade or other extreme conditions, you just can explore some alternatives. Um, in a situation like this, you can expand some mulch rings and just have that mulch to protect your soil. Uh, or you can look at alternative ground covers, um, something like ajuga or horse herb or frog fruit, or there's some sedges that do a really nice job in the shade. Um, one thing we really want to avoid up here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is we want to avoid bare soil. We are not the desert. We don't want to leave our soil exposed. We want to protect it because when we do get rainfall, that soil gets picked up, it gets moved into our water bodies and can cause issues depending on what's in that soil. So we really want to try to maintain living vegetation or some kind of protective layer anywhere that you have bare soil in your landscape. Just try to think about what can I do to protect that soil and really uh, try to keep that soil secure and safe from leaving that landscape. All right, next question. How deeply do we think a warm season Bermuda grass, uh, like Bermuda grass, can root? Whoops. <laughs> I guess it just kind of uh, uh, wrapped up there. But this is uh, so we see, so Dennis uh, guessed four to six. So, very often when I do programs like this, I hear something along these first two options. And we actually see under optimal conditions, uh, so not, you know, sometimes with our soils, we can have less than optimal conditions, but under optimal conditions, we can certainly see these grasses can root several feet into the soil when encouraged to do so. And so we really want to have that in the back of our mind that these grasses have the potential to root very deeply and deep roots are the key to a sustainable landscape and a resilient lawn. And so if you, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take away the fact that deep roots are very important and we wanna do whatever we can to get those roots as deep as possible in our landscape. Helen, you're on the leaderboard. You're you're our top, you're our winner right now. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about this in a little bit more detail. I'll try to be quick because I'm talking longer than I meant to already. Um, I want to talk about this idea of drought avoidance. A lot of our breeding programs across the country, which there's several, we have one at Texas A&M, there's one up at Oklahoma State, there's one at the University of Georgia, University of Florida, NC State. These are where a lot of the grasses that we have grown on golf courses, lawns, athletic fields are coming from, are these breeding programs. And a lot of them are trying to create grasses that are more drought resistant, that are low input grasses. And one of the big traits that a lot of them are focused on right now is something called drought avoidance. Drought avoidance, very simply, is a grass's ability to root more deeply in that soil and avoid drought. And so we're seeing that a lot of these turf grass breeders are bringing over genetics from Africa and other parts of the world where they can breed grasses that can root several feet into the soil and require less water overall. So this is really important to know because a lot of times we do think of grasses as rooting very shallowly and we don't always do our due diligence to encourage that deep rooting. Uh, this was a study that was done in San Antonio about 20 years ago now, and uh, they basically had two treatments. They had some of these grasses had a barrier 
to their root growth where they were not permitted to grow roots very deeply into the soil and others had unlimited rooting potential. This that you see here is an elaborate uh, turf grass torture device where they would pull a cover over the grass to keep it from getting watered. They exposed the grasses to 60 days of drought and they found that if these grasses could root unlimited, if they had unlimited rooting potential, they could all survive. Now, some of them go into what we call summer dormancy or, I, or we like to call it going blonde for summer Okay, meaning that they will slow down their growth, slow down their metabolism when we get into this time of year, uh, as, as we move further into July and August, and it just gets so hot, so dry. So they may lose their color, but they're not dead. And then when we get rainfall again in September, they'll start to green back up. So what we learned from this study is deep rooting potential is important. We wanna take practices that it can encourage that deep rooting as much as possible. Um, I'll use Tiff Tough. This is a newer Bermuda grass that's come out in recent years as one example. Um, so we've had one study that showed that over 40% of, of Tiff Tough roots were found between about six and 18 inches whereas only 22 to 26% of some other cultivars were growing roots at that depth. So we are seeing that some of these newer cultivars, they're growing roots much deeper. And we also know that Tiff Tough as an example requires about 32% less water than a lot of our commercial standards on the market. And it's coming from those deeper roots. And we're gonna see other grasses like Cobalt St. Augustine and some of our new zoysias, they're all gonna behave similarly. They're all gonna need those deep roots. And if we can encourage that, they will not need as much water. So here's our last question. What are some practices that can help promote deeper rooting and drought resistance? Choose all that apply. Watering deeply and less frequently, keeping a taller mowing height, cycle and soak irrigation, or offering your word, your lawn words of encouragement. So you can choose any that you think are practices that are going to promote deeper rooting and drought resistance in the lawn. <laughs> so Dennis put offer words of encouragement. I agree. I think why not? You know, time's up. Okay, so. The correct answer is you can do all, you could do all four, but these first three are all definitely practices um, that can make a big difference in promoting deep rooting and drought of, and drought resistance in your yard. So deep and infrequent irrigation helps to torture our lawn just enough that it, it motivates it to grow those roots deeper. If we're out there giving it a little syringe every day, a little shallow frequent irrigation, we're making little codependent lawn babies that want us out there every day, giving them that little shot of water. So we want it to go deeply and we want there to be enough time between watering that the top begins to dry down and those roots need to reach for something deeper and grow deeper. A taller mowing height, anything that you see above ground is gonna correspond to what you see below ground. We call that the root to shoot ratio. So the taller we keep our turf grass mowing height, typically the deeper our roots are gonna be. So as we get into this hottest part of the year, I start to raise my mowing height up quite a bit. So my St. Augustine right now, I'm mowing at five inches. And this time of year, I always have the best looking St. Augustine in the neighborhood. And it's not because I'm watering it a lot and it's not because I'm fertilizing it a lot. It's because I'm letting it be a little taller and I'm letting it have those deeper roots. So that's gonna help a lot. Bermuda grass, I usually let get up to about three inches, three and a half inches this time of year. Cycle and soak irrigation is going to help encourage that deeper watering. We're going to pulse that water in more gradually, allow it to saturate that soil profile more deeply, reduce the runoff from our landscape. So all of these are practices that are really going to help to encourage uh, that deeper water movement and that deeper root growth. And we'll talk about this a lot more, I think on August 2nd, I'll be coming back and I'll talk more about some of these practices um, and how we can use them to our advantage in the landscape and in the lawn. <laughs> I love this champion music that they play. That's awesome. Helen, you're a champ today. All right, so a couple little things before we wrap up today. Um, I do want to talk about if you're really trying to figure out the best way to implement an effective watering program in your landscape, you've got tools at your disposal. One of these tools is the Water My Yard program. It's just watermyyard.org. If you click that link, it'll open up in a separate browser window, then you can come back to the presentation. Um, so North Texas Municipal Water District is a partner with this AgriLife uh, 
uh, feature. And so what it'll do is you can sign up for um, uh, emails or text messages on a weekly basis. It'll tell you exactly how much you need to water and it's based on weather data in your area. And so it's gonna give you real time recommendations based on what's going on with rainfall, temperatures, et cetera, so that you know exactly how much you need to water each week to keep your turf grass healthy and happy. Uh, we're doing some new research now. My co my colleague here at the Dallas Center, Dr. Chrissy Seegers, a very good friend of mine, is working quite a bit with Helen and others to do some research here at the Dallas Center to further refine and improve these recommendations for North Texas. So they're putting in several new grasses. They're going to use the Water My Yard program to refine those recommendations. And so you'll get even more customized recommendations for our North Texas area and some of these new grasses that are coming out. So it's very exciting and keep an eye out for that. I know Helen's got a, a whole social media plan. I think that's going to launch and share a little bit more about that as it goes forward. So very exciting. That was the end. That was our final leaderboard. So thanks to Gail and Deborah for also participating. And that's what I've got. And then I think we're going to open it up for Q&A. I did throw my email in there at the bottom. If you've got some questions too that you're too shy to share here in a public forum, you're welcome to send me an email and I'll help you as much as I can. You're also welcome to email Helen. All right. And then I guess since we're done, Helen, are you okay with people just like unmuting and doing questions the old fashioned way or? Absolutely. So you're correct. Uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. If you are comfortable unmuting and asking Becky your questions, please do just remember that this session is being recorded. So your voice and or likeness will show up on that recording. And so just to get us started, uh, I have a question, Becky. So you had mentioned some other possibilities of ground cover. Um, you mentioned something called a juga and sedges. What are those? Yeah, so these are going to be uh, different from your typical turf grass. So ajugas are going to be small, adorable little ornamental plants. They tend to have uh, purple foliage. They tend to produce these really pretty purple flowers in the early spring. Um, and, and they'll tolerate a pretty decent amount of shade. We've got some here growing at the center. And we have other uh, options that are going to offer us some similar ground cover alternatives for shaded areas. So green and gray Santalina is another option. Um, we see that sedges like Texas sedge or Berkeley sedge have become popular options um, as kind of a dense ground cover that's going to have a different look and feel to it than a turf grass. Um, and so, you know, for example, we also use that in some of our stormwater infrastructure here at the Dallas Center. We've got some really neat sedges that are built into that. We've got some other native options that some people think of as being kind of weedy that can be really great for the shade. So I think I mentioned a couple. One is frog fruit, which I love frog fruit. I just think it is the cutest, sweetest little ground cover. Um, and I know we've got a couple of wholesale nurseries in the area that do sell uh, frog fruit. Just look for some. You may not be able to find it very easily at a big box store, but you can look at some of our local folks and you may have more luck. Um, but it also is pretty popular with pollinators. It's going to have nice little ground cover sprawl to it. Um, and then horse herb, um, which has several different names, but uh, that's one that definitely a lot of people think of as a weed. But, you know, the only time I see it acting weedy is when there's a lot of shade and it's because it's going to do better in the shade than some of our turf grasses. Um, and so that can be a great option as well, as well as again, just good old fashioned mulch. So uh, all good suggestions. And I have, I use horse herb in my landscape. I have it in that space between the sidewalk and the fence, also, often called the hill strip. So we were tired of mowing it. Our sprinkler systems don't touch that part. And so last, last, uh, last I guess the fall, we had it ripped out and uh, the grass dug up. I'm sorry, we had the grass ripped out and planted horse herb. And now I have uh, this real interesting texture with the leaves and how it spreads and also these pretty little yellow flowers yes. uh, next to my fence. Yeah. So, um, so speaking, you also mentioned frog fruit. So we had one question was about, and I don't know if you still have the availability to see it, your last slide. Uh, was that frog fruit on your last slide? It was not. That was just, I think, a St. Augustine turf with some moisture on it. Um, but I have some great pictures of frog fruit somewhere. Yeah. Or you can just Google it, but it's a very cute, very sweet. Um, and it's little leaves kind of look like little frog beets. 
Uh, so it's a good one. It is really attractive. All right, so we do have a question from Martha. It says, if you have St. Augustine in a shady area, could you put it, could you put a new, a, a new St. Augustine cultivar in with it, or do you need it to go to bare dirt and add new grass? Yeah, so that's a great question, Martha. It just really depends on um, what your goals are. So if you're comfortable with intermingled grasses, meaning, you know, two cultivars in the same landscape, then what you could do is go in and plug the new St. Augustine around this area. And over time, um, they'll start to cover whatever makes the most sense. So, um, you know, another example that I've seen before is uh, in College Station when I lived there, it was very common that you would see Bermuda grass in the full sun areas and St. Augustine in the shade, and they would create their own natural kind of threshold of where one did better than the other and sort of blend together. And I think you'd see something sort of similar when you're mixing cultivars together, that whatever is going to be the most shade tolerant will kind of dominate. Um, if there's more drought related stresses there, then that one, a different one may dominate. And so you can get that intermingling. Um, like I said, you can't plant St. Augustina seed, so it would have to be plugs. You'd have to go in and, and create enough soil contact there that they can take root. Um, and, you know, if you are doing a full renovation, then that's a little bit more involved. And that's where we would want to start with bare soil. So one thing I would not recommend that I have seen is people laying new sod on top of old dead sod. We definitely do not want to do that. We want to remove the vegetation that's there. It's even a good time to amend the soil. So up here in North Texas, incorporating some really good compost can help a lot with water infiltration and rooting potential. And then we want to lay that new sod. All right, thank you for that, Becky. All right, now Steve has a question. What are your thoughts on putting about a quarter inch of top dressing on your lawn? Yeah, so top dressing can offer a lot of great benefits. A uh, quarter inch is pretty modest, and so it kind of depends on what your mowing height is. Um, quarter inch is, is, I would do anything between an eighth or a quarter of an inch um, as long as I've got about a two inch mowing height or more. If I've got a really, really short lawn for whatever reason, then you may start with just an eighth of an inch. You just want to make sure that you're not smothering the turf. And then the other question would be kind of what you're top dressing with. And so some people use sand, some people use compost, some people use a combination of the two. The big thing we want to keep in mind with top dressing is that we never want to use a material that is a finer texture than our native soil. So for example, if the soil my grass is growing in is pretty sandy, and then I come in with a top soil that's, that's a little bit more loamy and clay, and I top dress over the top of that sand with that, I can actually create really big issues with water movement. We call it a perched water table, where the water just kind of ponds in that top layer and doesn't move down uh, appropriately. So whatever we choose to top dress with, we want to make sure it's a coarser texture, either a, a nice coarse sand or some sand with some sift compost in it. And then you just want to have a fine enough layer that you don't smother it, but you can get some good benefits from top dressing, including um, it can help sometimes with thatch breakdown. It can help to kind of level or even out an area. It can help with water infiltration. Um, so we do get some benefits there. Fantastic. That was a great question. All right, Becky, you got another one. What about yes. expanded shale when choosing to plant new sod? Expanded shale is definitely an option. So it is something that we recommend um, pre-plant incorporation, meaning you're tilling it in ahead of time into our heavy clay soils that we have in North Texas. Um, we see that as a recommendation for like earth kind landscaping in garden beds and vegetable gardens. And you can apply those same principles to a turf grass area. Um, so what I would typically recommend is um, combining it with some compost and incorporating that into the upper four to six inches. And then you'll just wanna kind of roll or smooth that soil out before you lay the sod. So we don't want to plant sod on very loose soil because as the soil settles over time, the sod will be very uh, ununiform. So you can incorporate some expanded shale in, um, roll that soil out. The expanded shale will help with infiltration rates. Uh, it'll help with water movement and rooting potential. Um, it can be kind of expensive especially to do it on such a large footprint for a lawn, but it can, can be worth it if you're getting that improved soil structure. And then, yeah, you can just go in and lay your new sod over, over top. All right, fantastic. Uh, last call for questions. If anyone else has uh, a question for Becky, uh, please add that in. Uh, okay, you're getting some thanks already. So uh, if, if you guys still have questions, please add them to the chat. And I'm just going to 
uh, mention our native plant giveaway briefly. So every time you attend one of the sessions in our series, which ends on August 30th, you get an entry into the drawing for up to four native plants. So the more sessions you attend, the more entries you get into the drawing. And we will have, uh, depending on how well I keep the plants alive, we're gonna have uh, at least between one and four winners who will receive up to five native plants each. Now, these plants need to be picked up in person. So somebody needs to come to pick them up. Unfortunately, we cannot deliver them. The pickup is in Wiley, Texas. It's at the NTMWD main campus at 501 East Brown Street. So if you are interested in that, uh, attend some more classes and be eligible for the drawing. Information about the drawing and all of the classes in this series are, is available at ntmwd.com slash classes. Um, so with that, I want to thank you, Becky, very much for spending your lunch hour with us. I know I learned a lot, and I also enjoyed uh, the, the slide, the, the quizzes, and the way I could interact with them, and I look forward to more presentations like that. So thank you, everyone, very much. We appreciate your time, and, um, and Becky, do you have anything you'd like to close with? I just want to say thank you for inviting me, and thank you guys for hanging out with me today and talking about turf. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone go out there and talk. Give, give your grass words of encouragement. They can make it through the summer with a little less water. Thank you, everybody.